Good afternoon. On behalf of the University at Buffalo, I'm so pleased to welcome everyone to today's town hall. Through our ongoing Let's Talk About Race series, we are affirming UB's commitment to ideals of social justice. We realize these ideals by harnessing our research, scholarship, and academic excellence for the benefit of society. And during times of turbulence, it is our imperative to double down on our mission-driven priorities. On that note, I have been profoundly moved by our community's many acts of service and scholarship on behalf of the greater good over the past year. The last time our university community met in this forum in November of 2020, we had just held a presidential election. Today, we have a new administration in the White House, but with the jarring images of an insurrection at the US Capitol still residing fresh in our memory. And so with our societal fractures laid bare, we are confronted with a moment of national reckoning. That is why conversations such as today's are both timely and necessary. Each of us has a critical role to play in healing our country's deep divisions. And I know that this afternoon's discussion with Dr. Loretta Ross will provide us with fresh insight on how we can break down barriers of fear and rebuild a culture of compassion. Before Dr. Ross shares her thoughts, I would like to welcome Dr. Miriam Thagar, Associate Professor of English. Dr. Thagar. Thank you. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the land upon which the University at Buffalo operates, which is a territory of the Seneca Nation, a member of the Haudenosaunee Six Nations Confederacy. Today, this region is still the home to the Haudenosaunee people, and we are grateful for the opportunity to live, work, and share ideas in this territory. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon, Professor Loretta J. Ross, a visiting associate professor of the study of women and gender at Smith College. Since her days at Howard University to her work establishing the Women of Color Program for the National Organization for Women, to her groundbreaking work with Sister Song, Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective, Professor Ross has demonstrated a firm commitment to social and reproductive justice. She's the author of three books, each of which illustrates how reproductive justice is both a theoretical pro paradigm as well as an active movement with a vibrant history. These books emphasize a central concept of her work, quote, all fertile persons and persons who reproduce and become parents require a safe and dignified context for these most fundamental human experiences. I could go on, but I wanna save as much time as possible to hear about her latest work. And with that, I'd like you to welcome Professor Loretta J. Ross. Well, thank y'all for such a wonderful and kind welcome. I am going to use screen share to see if I know what I'm doing with this technology but it's such an honor to have a chance to speak to y'all today. I will be going through a PowerPoint very fast. And because I'm a citizen of Texas, as well as the United States, when I speak at a New York speed, my words can get a bit blurred. And so there is a live transcript function that I invite people to use in case my words do get blurred. But I have to honestly say the live transcript function doesn't translate Ebonics very well. So I noticed that they kind of mangle the words even more so than I do. So let's start by sharing screen and getting to this PowerPoint. Hopefully you can see this. Can someone speak up and let me know? Yes. All right. As I said, uh, I've been working for the last five years on this concept called calling in the calling out culture. 
it actually began when I found extreme difficulty trying to communicate with my grandson down in Texas. He was at an age where he didn't pick up his phone. Everything went to voicemail and then his voicemail got full. And when I finally got hold of him, he said, well, grandma, why don't you just Facebook me? And so I joined Facebook. And the minute I joined, he migrated off to TikTok or Instagram or something because he said it was for old bogeys like me. But what I noticed when I got on Facebook was how mean people were to each other. I couldn't believe the way people had these short fuses and were just jumping down each other's throats. So I asked some young people around me what was going on. And the, this young woman I asked named Marissa said, oh, you mean calling out? And my first response was, you named it? Because I thought this was just so crazy. And she said, yep. Yeah. And so I asked her, what are y'all doing about it? And she kind of shrugged her shoulders and walked away. Well, what I figured out was that I've had 50 years of social justice activism, which began when I was 16. Uh, I joined the anti-rape movement in the 70s. I got tear gassed at my first demonstration when I was 16. I started my political work fighting apartheid in South Africa and gentrification in Washington, D.C. because I went, to, I went to Howard University. So I felt that this body of experiences be, being an early Black feminist, getting involved in social justice movements in 1970 could lend itself to understanding both the call-out culture and what we could do about it. Currently, I'm at Smith College teaching a number of courses. The one that I most enjoy is white supremacy in the age of Trump. And I've, as, as the introduction said, co-written three books on reproductive justice, and I spend a lot of time on national media, which is no big deal, by the way. You just have to learn to out-talk Joe Scarborough when you want to get on his show. So why calling in? I want to quote a famous African-American educator called Nanny Helen Burroughs. A lot of people are not familiar with her, but back in the early part of the 20th century, she started a school of excellence for black children in Washington, DC. And I believe that her quote is very appropriate right now. So a thought and reap a deed, so a deed and reap a character, so a character and reap a destiny. I do this calling in teaching with a very strategic plan in mind. I'm a member of the human rights movement and Dr. Martin Luther King in his last Sunday sermon, March 31st, 1968, invited us, demanded so much to build a US-based human rights movement. And when I first learned about this, I was shocked because I didn't learn about this last Sunday sermon until the 1990s from Reverend C.T. Vivian, who was my boss at the time. He was Dr. King's field lieutenant. And when I heard about this demand from Dr. King, I realized then that if I didn't know about it, maybe a whole lot of other people didn't know about it. So that's when Reverend Vivian and I founded the National Center for Human Rights Education. But I consider myself part of the women's rights wing of the human rights movement. Because I care about racial justice and white supremacy, I'm also part of the civil rights wing of the human rights movement. Because I'm disabled, I'm part of the disability rights wing of the human rights movement. I could go on and there isn't enough space to put enough circles up there, but, but we need these calling in practices because we need to recognize that we're all sectors of the same human rights movement. It is, uh, y'all are likely part of the educational justice wing of the human rights movement. And we can't spend our best energy fighting each other, even as we focus on different things. And I believe that the uh, current movement that I'm a part of, the human rights movement, spends too much time fighting each other, which is, I'm totally against. So what is calling in? Calling in is really a call out, but you do it with love. 
and respect because you want people to be held accountable for what they've done, for the harm you think they've done. But instead of you know, you using your raised voice, why are you doing this? Why are you calling them out? And calling out basically is an invitation to a fight. You're calling them in as an invitation to a conversation and requires giving each other the benefit of the doubt. Stop having a, our short fuses that blow up every time somebody says or does something that we disagree with. We're a, a pluralistic democracy. We're supposed to disagree with each other. What we're not supposed to do is to turn on each other because we disagree. And we really can be diverse people. We actually supposed to be diverse people, but we're on the same team and we're supposed to have differences of opinion. And we must invest in each other's growth in order to really save this democracy. And I will be talking more about that in a minute. Calling in is also an opportunity to self-assess, to figure out why you feel the urge to call somebody out, whether you wanna make that choice all the time, whether you need to apologize for people you've called out in the past, help me maybe repair the damages that you've called and changing your behavior. Since I teach this stuff online and, and in person, what I find is that however your mistakes were handled as handled when you were a child, however your family that raised you handled your mistakes, that's how you're going to judge other people's mistakes as an adult. So if you were punished severely for making mistakes as a child, then you feel it's normal to punish others for making a mistake. That's your default pattern. But if your mistakes were seen as learning opportunities and handled with love and grace and forgiveness, then that's what you're gonna pre be predisposed to offer others. And so the first step of calling in is self-assessing, how do I handle my own mistakes and how do I respond when other people make mistakes? And the mistakes don't actually have to occur. You just have to have the perception that somebody else has made a mistake. And you always have to remember the broader context that what somebody does when they're a teenager shouldn't be used as a gotcha moment 30 years later because we're all capable of growing. Everyone is as complicated as you are. So you always have to remember that broader context and that requires staying calm, sometimes putting a pause on your emotional reaction so that you can invite somebody to clarify what they said, kind of like, well, when you said that, I'm not sure what you meant by that. Is it okay for us to go out and have coffee so that I could get a better understanding of what you're thinking or what you mean? And of course, this requires using active and loving listening practices and be thankful that you've had this opportunity to grow together and to learn more about each other. Actually calling in is a continuum. First, there's calling out, as I said, we all know what that is. It's that publicly shaming of people for something that you think is wrong. It can happen in real life. It can happen uh, over social media. It happens a lot within the universities and the academy because we're taught that the best way to offer any kind of new insight ourselves is first call out the people who've gone before us. And every dissertation and thesis I've ever read starts with, well, so-and-so said this and they were wrong and now I'm gonna correct the record. I'm gonna get it right. And so we teach it as academic rigor, but it's becoming academic rudeness. Well, so we all know what calling out is. Calling on is an intermediate step. It's an opportunity to demand that the person who's done this microaggression or said something that you think is incorrect or behaved in an incorrect way, it's an opportunity for you to just stop and use a useful phrase that I love called, I beg your pardon. And you just sit there and let that lay there. And that gives the person the opportunity to review what they said or what their behavior was. 
You don't have to call them in. You don't have to call them out. You give them an opportunity with your patient listening for them to figure out if they want those words to land the way that they did. And so a lot of people find calling on uh, a demand that people do better a very useful intermediate step. And I beg your pardon, everybody can remember. Now calling in is at the end of the other end of the continuum from calling out. That's when you are in a sufficiently healed place to invest in another person's growth. That means you can put your response in the parking lot of your brain while you pay attention to the person and help them, in fact, see themselves more clearly, help them understand the impact of what they've said or done, and really help both of you learn how to be better together. But it does require not only emotional intelligence on your part, but it also requires an emotional investment. And the first thing I wanna say about calling in is that you don't have an obligation to call anybody else in. Your first obligation is to see to your own healing, to see to your own preservation. So calling in has to be a choice that you make. Uh, there's a useful metaphor from the book that Sherry Moraga and Gloria Anzaldua wrote in 1981 called This Bridge Called My Back. And when you are serving as a calling in bridge, you need to recognize that that is a position that must be voluntary because by definition, it's a very invisible position. Because when people are crossing a bridge, going to a new understanding, they're only paying attention to two things, where they're coming from and where they're going. The last thing that they're noticing is the bridge itself, unless it starts wobbling or something. And if you're not in a sufficiently healed space, you're gonna be that wobbly bridge. And so that's why paying attention to your own needs is important so that you can prepare yourself to be a bridge if necessary. But that's why it has to be voluntary, as I said, because it, it's a choice to be a bridge builder versus being front and center with your needs. I think all of our educational institutions are selected because they, people expect us to provide this transformative education. And we want our students to become leaders and advocates for social change. And we've got to implement transformative teaching, but sometimes it risks backlash from donors and parents because people you know, can get threatened with job loss if they address controversial topics. But I'm an advocate of believing that transforming, transformative learning in the Fieri model must be accompanied by transformative practices like calling in. As a matter of fact, I think we're making a mistake if we offer this, this, this radical con, uh, concepts to students like understanding and identifying sexism, racism, homophobia, transphobia, all the phobias and isms that we can talk about and teach about. But if we don't accompany that with transformative practices like calling in and conflict resolution and, and building organizational uh, strength and, and individual and emotional stamina, then they're gonna take these radical concepts that we taught them and weaponize them against each other. I have yet to see a school where that's not taking place at. And so we've got to make our values real. Our philosophical vision as a school has to shape how we teach the content of what we teach and, teach and what actions we take. But I also find, because I spend a lot of time at various schools, that not all faculty and staff even know what a transformative and progressive education can be. And so they can't create a win-win situation. They tend to approach it like our society does as a zero sum game. That if I uh, teach this around racial consciousness, for example, then white folks, and particularly liberal white folks will start feeling racial resentment as if they lost something. 
But when the educators don't speak on important political matters, they're actually teaching apathy in the face of injustices. And I don't think that's the outcome that those of us with these great progressive mission statements at our school want to achieve. And there really is a failure K through 12 to teach students how to be engaged in a democracy. There's a total drop off in civics education, which is why most Americans today can't even name the three branches of government. When I went to school in the 50s and the 60s, it was required. Right now, we're teaching to test. And if civics is not on those tests, the people coming don't know it. And so transformative learning requires that you're making a long-term investment into their critical skills of inquiry through a Freire-based empowerment model. You have to teach literacy about history and help them develop that lifelong commitment to justice. And really, instead of teaching our political perspectives, which I don't think is necessary, teach them how important developing their integrity is. Because as I believe, your reputation is what other people think that they know about you, but your integrity is what you know about yourself. And I think you should guard your integrity and screw the reputation because you'll never actually control what other people think about you in the first place. And that is so important. We do not teach young people how to successfully guard their integrity. And in this media obsessed culture of ours, they're too busy curating reputations online and in real life. I think it can be taught, intersected with all of our existing disciplines without sacrificing time and other subjects. And we also, and I think COVID has made this very obvious, that we have to understand our mutual interdependence, which is part of the human rights framework, by the way. Uh, so if you want me to talk more about human rights, I can do so at another time. One of the things I'm doing at Smith is developing a human rights education institute because currently there's no undergraduate program that teaches people human rights in the way that I think it should happen. Anyway, developing empathy for others is part of burnishing up your own integrity and love for self. And then we need to teach people how to make better threat assessments because everything we disagree with uh, you know, doesn't have to be read as a threat because there's a difference between debating ideas, feeling uncomfortable, dealing with microaggressions or reversing that into microaffirmations, being offended, and then someone actually threatening your life. But right now, with these short fuse conversations, all of that gets conflated. So there's someone that can make me uncomfortable, for example, using the wrong gender pronoun, feels like a threat. And we've got to stop this overstatement of harm and figure out how we can normalize a calling in culture for all settings. And this reduces the need for punishing each other. Septima Clark was a famous educator and organizer in South Carolina. And she says, I believe unconditionally in the ability of people to respond when they are told the truth. We need to be taught to study rather than to believe, to inquire, rather to than affirm. And we're right now in a polarized position in our society where people don't do independent study. They don't make up their own minds. They actually get easily manipulated by people that they trust who are willing to manipulate them into challenging truth, science, facts, media, education, all the things that should be foundational within a democracy. So when our students arrive at our colleges, they're socialized maybe into thinking that differences are too scary to even talk about them. And they may be from households where people didn't teach them around issues of race, disability, gender, sexuality, or immigration. And so they are like remarkably naive 
on racial and sexual literacy when they come to my classes. And I assume that's pretty universal. And because I teach at Smith, I get a, a good balance of students who come from private schools where their parents paid $60,000 a year for them to go to school, public schools, which are free, and home schools. I mean, there's about a third, third, third in my classes and the same illiteracy is across the board. And so maybe it's part of our culture to try to cultivate this concept of childhood innocence and then send them off to college to become adults. And I'm like, well, wait a moment. When that happens in my first year students, and I'm giving them a larger view of the world than they previously saw in their home environments, the first thing they do is get angry at their parents and start distrusting everything that they've been told to date because they're like, why didn't my mom and dad tell me these things? Why am I just now hearing about this stuff? And I don't think it's fair. I think it's actually bad parenting to send a child out into the broader world so ill-prepared around protecting their innocence. And even worse, they, they're taught that being colorblind is a good thing, yet that reinforces racial illiteracy in particular, and they visit that illiteracy onto their classmates, some of whom are students of color, and then next thing you know, the campus has an explosion. <laughs> Uh, a black act controversy. So when they when students arrive, like I said, they 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 think that noticing differences is the problem and rude actually, but the differences are actually a strength in our society. And when we appreciate diversity with the appropriate language, and children do form biases as early as five years old even if they have not been directly engaged with conversations on these differences, and they'll act on these biases at school. And then, as I said earlier, the patterns for handling mistakes are also formed early in life. So you can end up at the fight reflex, you are wrong, I am right, or the flight reflex, let's talk about something else, I'm tired of this subject, or the freeze, respect, uh, re freeze reflex, which a lot of people describe as going numb, like a deer in headlights, not knowing what to do. And I don't wanna talk or listen when I'm in that freeze mode or the fawn reflex, which is performative. You know, oh, I so appreciate hanging out with, you know, people of color or, you know, I like black music or whatever, moving right along. And but but it really does predict how they respond to mistakes by others. And their identities do matter to them, especially their racial and gender identities. And we take those things very seriously at colleges, but we need to also take as seriously teaching them a responsible and empathetic way to handle their emerging gender uh, identity formations and stuff. And we can actually help them find joy in learning about other people instead of dreading it with badly done DEI work and stuff like that, so that they can really see how much fun it is to work on human rights. One of my mentors, Leonard Zeskin, uh, told me a long time ago, he said, fighting Nazis should be fun. It's being a Nazi that sucks. <laughs> and if we don't help people find joy in doing human rights work, they might rightfully say, why would I wanna work with you when you're gonna make me feel worse than before I met you? We have to figure out a way to do better. And I think part of that is calling in. I cannot tell you the number of campuses, I can't even keep track, who've had black at controversies since the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and on and on. And they're using social media as their power platform, the students are. And it creates an opportunity for racial reckoning within the campus. And it provides an opportunity to look at the school's mission statements and make them palpable in the life of students. The students are using these black act controversies to tell stories in ways that can't be ignored. And it really has an impact when the alumna 
uh, uh, start joining with the students and say, well, I experienced this at the school 30 years ago when I was black going to this school. And now it's a shame how it's still happening 30 years later. When, you, when those two perspectives twin up, it can't be ignored by the school any longer that this is a long stand, standing systemic problem that needs to be addressed. And many high achieving black students report that they get discouraged by people who are dealing with racial illiteracy as if their success is going to be totally compromised by their race. And we see a lot of casual use of racial slurs by white staff and faculty with no consequences, like Ta-Nehisi Coates said. But the problem with using the N-word is not that you're using it, but, but really the problem is, why would you want to? Because that bespeaks your character and your willingness to wound other people just because you can get away with it. And so we have to have these conversations. And then repeated complaints about faculty are swept under the rug, uh, usually treated as an HR problem instead of a public facing problem that needs to be addressed. And so people are demanding, stop going from these private censures and really make them more public with transparency so that other people learn not to make the other mistakes and that you're taking these complaints seriously. And so most times the bad news stories are locked down as for public relations, as opposed to really sincerely addressing the problems. And if you lock them down that way, it pretty much guarantees that they will reoccur. And when we do try to address these things in a proactive way, it will then, as I said, increase the white racial resentment, especially amongst people who define themselves as liberal, and actually may even increase the racist comments directed towards students of color. But we can use these Black Act controversies in a constructive way. We can, first of all, prove to ourselves that these problems exist, and secondly, develop proactive strategies because as predictable as the sun will rise tomorrow, you can imagine that another black at, queer at, trans at controversy is sitting right around the corner. So that's why it's so important for us to be proactive. I think one of the reasons we are slow on the uptake is that we confuse the ideology of white supremacy with the white identity. White supremacy is a body of ideas. Anybody can be a white supremacist. You don't have to be white to be a white supremacist and not all white people are white supremacists. But if you su subscribe to the ideas of white supremacy, you believe in uh, homophobia, transphobia, sexism, racism, anti-Semitism, biological determinism, Islamophobia, Christian nationalism, et cetera. But you could have a white identity without subscribing to white supremacy. And so that's what makes people a lot of nervous around understanding how to have appropriate whiteness without the ideology of white supremacy. And I should add that I'm teaching an online class on white supremacy starting February 24th. You can find information about it on my website. Each class is only $5 a lecture, four classes. So it's a total of $20 to get lectures on white supremacy. The same thing I'm offering to students at Smith, I'm offering to the general public. And my website is lorettajross.com. And I think one of the problems is where whiteness studies has landed us because whiteness studies is almost predicated on the assumption that being white is the problem. And, and I understand whiteness is a social construction and so is blackness and all of that, but I'm not here to debate postmodern theory. I'm just trying to say that whiteness studies, when it starts at a foundation by, with the presumption that being white is a problem, they tend to land at believing that people should somehow figure out a way to be less white. And I'm like, how's that supposed to work? How can people change characteristics that are beyond their control 
and then left feeling guilty and shameful for things that they can't change. And it scares them out of saying, you know, of doing anything. That's what Robin DiAngelo problematic as some of her teaching is, calls white fragility. And we end up with our human rights movement spaces becoming public therapy sessions for people processing their emotions around whiteness instead of taking action to build what I really desire to see, which is white courage. And this whole race blind, colorblind stuff and pretending to be so really reinforces an unconscious superiority complex and ignores white privilege. One of the most frustrating things I experienced in doing interracial work as, as, as organized by white people is when they have this false humility of, we want all the people of color to speak up first and you white people, you step back because white people of color voices have been too suppressed. I'm like, really? <laughs> is that the best you can do to piss off all the white people because people of color are now privileged to, to speak up when most people of color don't need saving by you? I mean, this whole thing is very complicated, but moving right along. So to develop our racial courage, we have to have intentional work. We also have to become less judgmental and stop being the blame and shame gang calling each other out. Oh my God. The funniest thing that I experienced working up in the Pioneer Valley is every time I meet a white person who's really trying to work hard on becoming a, an anti-racist white ally, they immediately, after they tell you, your, their, tell you their name and what they do, they start rolling out what I call the black people resume. Oh, I have a black friend. Oh, I dated a black guy one time. Oh, I'm the parent of a, of, of a racially different, meaning non-black, a non-white child or blah, blah, blah. Or I know this black person. Do you know this person kind of thing? And it's kind of, I, at first I used to be offended by it, but I've learned to just be amused by it. Cause I asked myself, I wonder if they would see what they're doing if I roll out the name and relationship of every white person I know in my introduction to them. I mean, but they're really earnestly trying to separate themselves from those other white people who are part of or, or embrace the whole white supremacist framework. And so I understand and appreciate the effort, but we've got to develop better skills, better tools, and more courage in doing it in an appropriately white way. And that's one of the things that I'm working on. Um, but I think people can learn from their mistakes and practice and have these meaningful conversations from the first day and throughout our entire learning process when we come to campuses and you know, turn the conversations around from being difficult into being joyful. One of the things that helps is separating the concept of blame versus responsibility because no one alive has constructed the system of white supremacy that we're dealing with, but we all bear responsibility for ending it. It's like the metaphor that Isabel Wilkerson uses in our book, Cast, where she talks about moving into a house with bad plumbing. And you're not to be blamed for the house's plumbing being bad because you just bought the thing. But at the same time, you bear a responsibility for fixing that plumbing if you intend on living in and benefiting from that house. And so if you see white supremacy through the lens of that metaphor, no, nobody alive created this system of white supremacy. But if we plan on living in a democracy that is not destroyed and overturned by white supremacy, then we need to accept the responsibility for ending white supremacy. So blame becomes an unhealthy response where responsibility is a much healthier response. Mav Segris is a friend of mine. He joined me in doing anti-fascist work in the 1990s when I worked with Reverend Vivian. And Mav was on my board of directors because she had started an organization called North Carolinians Against Racist and Religious Violence. But she's written this wonderful book because Mav's family was in the Ku Klux Klan. And of course, she had to reconcile that family history also with the fact that she was 
coming out in Alabama as a lesbian in the 1970s and what she had to deal with within her family as well as politically. And she writes that white people need to learn to love ourselves. White people should work with other whites against racism and middle-class whites need to deal with their own class biases to do so. And I'm quoting Matt because when we say, when black people say, go talk to your own people, that doesn't mean go talk down to your other, to other white people. Don't try to virtue signal how woke you are against the other white people who you believe aren't as woke. When I teach white supremacy and calling in in my classes, I show people the two contrasting pictures of the Statue of Liberty. On the right is the one where we're, is, the, is the photo that we're most familiar with representing freedom and coming to a liberated land based on that Emma Lazarus poem that we are all familiar with. But when France gifted this statue to the United States, most people didn't know that there are broken shackles around her feet because they awarded us or gifted us this statue because they were celebrating the emergence of America as a democracy after the enslavement period. So the Statue of Liberty represents the end to slavery, not the welcoming of immigrants. So it actually could be read that way, but really France was very intentional putting those chains, breaking those chains around the feet of liberty. And when we're teaching about the Statue of Liberty or the, the, the tenuous nature of American democracy, we're not, we're not talking honestly about the choice that's before us in the, that faced us in the past or the ones in the present. And we're in the middle of America's unfinished civil war. Of course, we saw that January 6th at the US Capitol. And this whole myth that America is divided is being pushed by the media media because the reality is that the country is not divided. White people are divided over the choice of chaos or community. And this is the question that Dr. King asked because white supremacy and democracy are fundamentally incompatible. And if you wanna just pay attention, notice how many euphemisms the media uses to avoid saying white people like working class, angry voters, patriots, soccer moms, all that kind of thing. Here's some of those words, and I'm not going to try to read them all off to you, but uh, I can actually provide y'all with a copy of this PowerPoint if y'all like to use it in the future. But just look at this for a minute and get an idea of how many euphemisms you see in the media every day to avoid saying white people, which is a subtle way of reinforcing the paradigm of white supremacy. Rural Americans, legal voters, Trump supporters, gun owners, on and on and on. Fannie Lou Hamer, of course, was a major activist uh, for voting rights in Mississippi who really believed in the promise of young people. And, and she said, because of these young people, I think for the first time we have a chance to make democracy a reality in the United States. So having said that, I just wanna point out some things that happened in the last two elections. You can read the words for yourself, but it was interesting while white youth were the likeliest youth to, to, to support Trump with 43% between ages of 18 and 29 voting for Trump. The real break happened because every white demographic supported Trump except young white people. When 56% of young white voters voted for Biden and they were the only white age group that repudiated Trumpism. That has never happened before in America, where there was a severe generational split between those who supported white supremacy and those who voted against it. And so I have take a lot of hope how, out of how woke young people are. And it's almost as if we elders have to run and keep up with them because they're very, they have a very intersectional analysis. They have a very 
uh, optimistic view in many ways of the future. And some of them even risk breaking with their families who are still, on whom they're still dependent to express themselves politically in a different way. Uh, because I'm running out of time, I'm not gonna spend a lot more time on these, on these slides, except that a lot of these young people that we're talking about who are now young voters come from new, new American communities, not so new, but basically saying that they are communities that are now taking their place in controlling and dictating our democracy. I think that one of the things driving Trumpism is this fear of uh, what they call white grievance anxiety, as well as white extinction, extinction anxiety, because in a few, few short decades, white people will become one of many minorities within this pluralistic republic of ours. And so we're seeing the children of immigrants uh, who are also standing up and taking their places in society and they're doing so despite the intentional deconstruction of civics education in our schools. And many of them only know Obama as the president. So they actually had, you know, the normalization of a different type of president than their previous generation. And so like Ta-Nehisi Coates spoke about in his brilliant article, Trump is therefore their first white president whose only qualification was his whiteness, because it certainly was the fact that he was competent in any kind of way. And they are not single issue voters. They prefer an intersectional approach. And in many ways, it's interesting how less susceptible they are to QAnon and deep state conspiracy theories, because they grew up having skepticism on everything they see online. Uh, they're, they're less likely to be manipulated than their parents, in the fact. We also have to recognize that, you know, we have to use calling in practices to understand that good intentions are not enough because we have to unlearn our unconscious habits that in addressing differences that can do more harm than good, no matter how good our intentions are. And, you know, when we practice this lack of transparency and active secrecy on difficult issues, we actually are creating more confusion and divisions between white students and students of color. And then we work on this very simplistic binary worldview that assumes that race issues are only for students of color to learn about, gender issues are only for female students, disability issues are only for students who are disabled, queer issues are for GNC students, on and on and on. And so we offer this very binary simplistic framework that actually undermines our good intentions. And when we exclude students from these conversations based on identity, it actually can backfire. And again, create that subtle white resentment or you know, increase the microaggressions or the outright aggressions that can take place. And then it leaves the burden of explaining these things onto the students instead of it being the adults who are supposed to say, wait a moment, this is how things really need to work. And so we've got to foster these uh, innate empathy skills as a leadership development process so that we can help them build healthier relationships in life. It doesn't even matter if the call outs are good or bad. Uh, it doesn't, it's not based on a particular membership in any group. Everybody makes mistakes, how we handle them matter. If people make mistakes and are offered a chance to do better and don't, this is when I call them out. But if people make mistakes and they're offered a chance to do better and really commit to doing better, this is when I call them in. And it really is important to define harms versus discomfort and teach people how to handle getting call out on social media and in real life. Again, I'm gonna reinforce that we need accurate threat assessments. Our goal is to become a calling in champion, not a calling out problem. And to think about these things differently and really accept that you could live a joyful but imperfect life. This pursuit of political purity that people are pushing is a false solution. And again, I cannot say enough about guarding your own integrity and determining how you want to walk in the world. One of the things that people 
who have fallen down the rabbit hole of the call out culture tell me is that they don't like what they've become. They don't, they make a lot of decisions that they can't look into, look at without shame. And they don't want to do the calling out stuff anymore. And I think that's why I attract 700 people uh, every Tuesday night to my calling in online lectures because people are desperate for another way to walk in the world. And it's not to, intended to swallow the hurt, but to call people in, which does take a lot of courage. And of course, when you try to do this, you're gonna increase your troller and hater traffic. So that's why you need to understand that you're doing the right thing and you're fighting the good fight in a much better way. So this is calling out, criticizing other people's social perspectives, banishing people because they're not woke enough, seeking that political purity of opinion, and sometimes using social justice activism to boost one's ego or standing in community. Most calling outs end up being magnified, and Natalie Wynn talks about this. First of all, there's a presumption of guilt instead of presumption of innocence. So if somebody says something that is seen as racist or sexist, Nobody questions it. It just says, yes, it must have been racist or sexist unless they're into denying it. And then that will risk them being called racist or sexist. So it's really a complicated thing. And then it goes from being called, the thing that they did being called racist or sexist, it gets abstracted so that then it becomes attached to their character. So it's not that so-and-so said something that was racist, but so-and-so is a racist. That's the essentialism that happens quickly. And then the people who make these accusations are using a kind of pseudo moralism or intellectualism. I know it's racist because I've read da 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 da, or I believe it's so and so and so, or you know, I'm a better person than they are, I'm less racist than that kind of stuff. And it creates this whole culture of unforgettability and unforgivability uh, where the person who is called out is damned if they do and damned if they don't. So that if they try to offer an apology, an apology for the behavior, it will be immediately cast and read as insincere. But if they don't offer an apology for the behavior, then they will be read as trying to evade accountability. And then there's this whole concept of if you hang out with someone who says something racist, then you must be a racist too. And so you end up with this inflation uh, guilt by association contamination thing. And all of this is based on false binaries, good versus evil, gay versus straight, trans versus cis, on and on and on. We have all these false binaries that make people very judgmental and basically sabotaging our ability to work together. And it replicates the system, uh, the, the prison industrial complex that we're trying to avoid it discourages people from learning. It frightens people into speaking up. A lot of people are afraid to speak up for fear that they will be called out themselves. And then when they do speak up, they're gaslighted as if their truths are not real or something. And it drives people away from it. Um, and it's usually done by very privileged people weaponizing their woke language and stuff. And it makes accountability difficult because why would I confess to my mistakes, even if they are legitimate mistakes, if everybody's going to jump down my throat for even saying I did something wrong? Matter of fact, it's going to encourage people to hide their mistakes, not run and tell them. And it devalues people's lived experiences by isolating them instead of uniting them. But most importantly, it makes people cynical, feel hopeless feel like nothing can be done. I'm at 12.55, so I wanna stop the share and see where we are on a time check. And I've got more PowerPoints that I could go through, but I'd also want to have discussion if people want that, so. Absolutely, Professor Ross, thank you for that fantastic and important talk. It's a pleasure and a privilege to hear you speak. There are loads of questions uh, very good questions, um, and people would like also the PowerPoint as well. 
I'm Carrie Toronto Brayman. I'm the director of the University of Buffalo's Gender Institute and professor of English here. And I have the honor of moderating the Q&A today. Please submit your questions and we will do our best to address many of them. Let's just jump right in. Uh, someone wrote, most of the people I experience behaving badly on social media um, are engaged in ignorant bullying behavior like telling a stupid joke, but otherwise are nice people under different circumstances. I want to call them in, but not sure how to do it without being marginalized as one of those liberal academics. And someone else similarly wrote, how do you use the techniques of Paulo Freire to bring the call in people? So really concrete advice people are asking for. Yeah, uh, well, the first thing is that you need to learn to speak to people's values versus their behaviors and words. Because if you only focus at that superficial level of behaviors and word, first of all, you're going to be triggered yourself by that behavior in those words. And so you're not going to be able to keep their full humanity in the picture because you're flattening them out to those behaviors or words. And so I find that if you sincerely believe that the person who's making that sexist or racist joke or comment or stuff is actually a good person, you can stop and say, you know, I know you're a good person. Why, you know, I really do feel in my heart you're a great person. So why is it that your inner great person, your inner good person isn't matching what you just said? Can you, can you explain that to me? Again, it's without making a direct accusation, you can invite them to self-interrogate whether that's how they want to walk through the world. And, so, and many times that cognitive dissonance of not of having such an interior good opinion of themselves, not matching their behavior is where the epiphanies happen. Because then they start saying, oh my goodness, I know I'm a good person, but why is it my friend not seeing me as a good person? And so speaking to those values underneath are a good strategy. Very good, and, and posing it as a question so you're not cultivating defensiveness right. on their part. Others have said, what are the limits to call-in culture? And you know, you've mentioned yourself how calling in is not for everything and not for everyone in light of the January 6th Capitol attacks, um, riots. Um, what do you do with the unpersuadables? Right, as someone said, those who see us as subhuman, what are the limits to calling in culture? Well, I think we have to work strategically. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a chart that I could show y'all, but it's not in this PowerPoint, that's called my sphere of influence. And so when I send y'all the deck, I'll make sure I put it in here. Right. But most of us on this call are what I call our 90 percenters. And that means because we share a worldview that's 90% in unity with each other, meaning we oppose racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, xenophobia, we even know the meaning to all these words, right? And we really blow ourselves up when we spend too much time trying to turn 90 percenters into 100 percenters, because we have this mistaken belief that if your political beliefs are not perfectly aligned with my political belief, then you're doing something wrong and I'm doing something right. So that's where the calling out happens horizontally amongst the 90 percenters trying to turn us into some kind of human rights cult. Then outside of us are the 75 percenters. As an abortion rights activist, for example, my 75 percent on which I could have influence would be like the Girl Scouts. The Girl Scouts uh, believe in women and girls empowerment. So we've got a lot of common ground right there as a feminist, but at the same time, they're gonna be repelled by the 90% the language that I use. I'm gonna talk about xenophobia, neoliberal capitalism and blah, 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 blah. They're like, wait a moment. <laughs> That's not our language. And the fact that you're even using it on us, it feels very elite, feels very off-putting to us. It feels very condescending and judgmental. And so we have to change our register and also change the expectation that we're gonna turn the 75 percenters into 90 percenters. We don't need to if we build that common agenda. Outside of the 75 percenters are the people I call the 50 percenters. 
these are people like my parents. Uh, my father was a Jamaican immigrant, went into the military as a teenager, lying about his age, was a lifer, stayed in for 26 years, and ended up very conservative, a weapons specialist who was a member of the National Rifle Association. My mother's Southern Evangelical Christian from Texas. And so we didn't have a whole lot of common political ground when I became, <clears throat> when I became a human rights activist. But well, my mother had started a Girl Scout troop for black girls in the 1960s because we weren't allowed to join the white Girl Scout troop. And every weekend to earn our badges, we had to cook food for homeless people. And finally, I got to my mother because she couldn't understand what I did as a human rights feminist. She just couldn't get it. I said, mom, do you remember when we fed the hungry people as Girl Scouts? Of course she remembered that. I said, well, you fed the hungry. And as a human rights activist, I asked why they're hungry in the first place. Mm -hmm. And she got it. So that's speaking to her values, even if I'm manifesting them differently. So everyone in our sphere of influence even if they're at that 50% level, has values that we resonate with that we can speak to. And the danger of the 50% level is that it's so smack dab in the middle, they can go to the left or the right. And as a matter of fact, the problem with our democracy is the influence has been coming from the far right to the center, as opposed to coming from the progressive in the other way. And that's what the Republicans have done for the last 50 years has moved what used to be on the margins of our society into the mainstream as public policy. And that's what we have to fight. Outside of the 50 percenters or the 25 percenters, these are the Trump supporters. I don't think everybody who's a Trump supporter is a racist, homophobic dog, I mean, whatever you wanna say. But I do think that they're easily persuaded and manipulated by the other circle outside of them, and that's the zero percenters. Those are the actual fascists white supremacists, patriot members, those kinds of things. And so I'm not trying to call in anybody beyond that 50% mark, but we can consolidate that base. Once you get to the 25 and the zeros, I am leaning towards calling you out, even though I'm still gonna give you the benefit of the doubt. But like Maya Angelou says, once they show me who they are, I'm gonna believe them. But some of the interesting stories, are how you've dealt with call-in culture of fascists and white supremacists like Floyd Cochran, right? Right. Do you want to- from your, your neck of the woods. He was from mm -hmm. upstate New York. Absolutely. And we have students from that region as well. Could you tell us uh, sort of that experience of really the, the most extreme version of call-in culture, right? When a white supremacist reaches out to you. Right. In 1993 or four, I can't remember, I think it was 1993, I get this call while I'm at the National Anti-Klan Network, the Center for Democratic Renewal, because I was their program director under Reverend C.T. Vivian's leadership. Anyway, I get this call and this bass voice says, hello, I'd like to speak to Leonard Zeskin. And of course, we never did just connect people. We wanted to find out who they, are, who they were because our, five, our offices uh, our uh, Reverend Vivian's house had been firebombed in the past. So we just did, for security reasons, we didn't just connect people. Anyway, I said, well, who's calling please? And he said, Floyd Cochran. And I went, the Floyd Cochran? <laughs> we monitored this guy. At the time, Floyd was the national spokesman for the Aryan nations up in Hayden Lake, Idaho, working with Reverend Pastor Richard Butler and stuff. So he was very famous for those of us who monitored hate groups. And so I didn't, you know, I was, I was in disbelief that he was calling us, but it turns out that the reason Floyd was calling us was because his second son had been born with the cleft palate, you know, with the lip thing. And uh, his Nazi buddies told him that his son was a genetic defect who needed to be put to death. And that was a wake up call for Floyd. Now, Floyd had joined the Nazis when he was 14 years old because he was a small, white, skinny kid who got bullied in upstate New York. And then he found that when he put on the Nazi uniform, nobody bullied him anymore. Instead of him being afraid, everybody was afraid of him. So that bespeaks 
to how these alienated young white men are being radicalized by the normal brutality that they grow up with. And they could go either to the left or the right, but a lot of them end up in the hate movement. And so Floyd had his epiphany and that's why he reached out to us largely because Pastor Butler kicked him off the compound for asking too many questions about this white supremacist Nazi fascism that he believed Floyd had believed in from 14 to 35. And um, he wanted to go on a tour of atonement because he'd also had recruited, he was a, a great recruiter of racist skinheads. He brought a lot of young alienated people into the hate movement because of his own personal experiences. And he got to know the Bible really well. So he would go to Christian camps and stuff like that and use those as platforms to recruit people into the hate movement, into the Aryan nations. And so he wanted to go on an atonement tour because he had recruited these two brothers from Allentown, Pennsylvania, called Freeman, who came from a stable middle-class family. You wouldn't even think that they were alienated because they had a, apparently up until that time, good relationships with their family. But one weekend they came home and murdered their entire family, the mother, the father, and their 12 year old brother in Allentown. And so Floyd felt very guilty about that. And so that was his atonement tour. And I went on it with them. And, you know, a lot of people thought we were on tour together because he left the Aryan nations because he's fallen in love with a black woman, which was not true. Um, Floyd had a relationship with the woman, the mother of his kids. And I'm not in, I'm not in the habit of falling in love with skinny Nazis, but that's what everybody wanted to believe <laughs> you know, about us. But the, I'll conclude this story by saying that a lot of people believe the Hollywood stories that people have these changes of heart when somebody shows them the way or they fall in love with somebody or that's, uh, someone penetrates the group and flips them. And that's just Hollywood. Usually they have their own epiphanies long before they even reach out to somebody who can help them re-enter normal society and stuff. So don't believe the hype that you can just go in and flip somebody in that 0% thing because most likely you will end up getting flipped simply because you're naive and impressionable. And listening to Lloyd Cochran's story and the guilt and the remorse he had made me think about seemingly negative emotions like anger, like guilt. Do you see those negative emotions as having a constructive value for social justice movements? I find anger a very self-defeating uh, 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 emotion. First of all, I have a tendency to internalize my anger. I don't exhibit it outward. I actually exhibit it towards myself. And so it, I, I prefer to use outrage and injustice instead of anger at individuals as my motivation. Because outrage is an outward facing emotion for me where anger is an inward facing emotion. Guilt, I don't think is useful for anybody. I mean, guilt should may, maybe can accompany when you've actually done harm and, and you want to uh, uh, make reparations for the harm you've done, that kind of thing. But it, it's got a real short shelf life as far as I'm concerned. And the more you feel guilty and bring that to the human rights movement, the more you're gonna assume the human rights movement is a public therapy space to absolve you of guilt. And so within our movement spaces, it, it doesn't work at all well. Um, and so I, it was actually through therapy that I started to work on my anger against the rapist who had raped me when I was 11 and the guy who committed incest against me who was a cousin when I was 14. I was so unbelievably angry at men I, and particularly black men that I had to have real good professional work on my head. Uh, because I had five brothers and a dad. And, you know, so I had to balance good men in my life versus bad, bad men who've done terrible things to me. And to reconcile those two parts of my lived experiences. And so I say, take your guilt and your anger to your therapist and then bring your, you know, and at the same time, you can bring yourself to the movement. Because the purpose of the human rights movement is to end oppression, not to solve your personal angst. And you say that, that 
in, in your powerful op-ed in the New York Times in 2019, don't you, where you say your concern is that uh, social movements are turning into therapy sessions and they're distinct and they need to be distinct. Did you want to clarify um, that point? Well, I think I've said a lot about it because I think that's one of the unfortunate consequences of a couple of converging ten tendencies. First of all, I think it's where whiteness studies has landed up. I also think as one of the early founders of the anti-violence movement that we created these concepts called safe spaces and triggers and stuff, gifted them to the world that have then now been distorted and pervert, perverted so that now we think every uncomfortable conversation is unsafe by definition and should be protected from triggers by definition. And of course, that's just inhibited, inhibiting frank and honest discussion about difficult issues we need to have. And so as far as I know, a trigger, which I'm very susceptible to myself, is an involuntary jettisoning of my consciousness back into a, a previously experienced trauma. And it's so involuntary that I can't pull myself out of that, that out of that trauma, you know, because this glass wall of memory is in the way. And it takes a professional to pull you out of a real trigger incident. And so what I've learned is that if you can still tell what year it is, you're not being triggered, you're being discomfited. Mm -hmm. That's an important distinction. Someone has written in saying, are there other things that white people who are trying to be anti-racist black allies should be doing in addition to calling in? Well, one of the things that I emphasize in my white supremacy class is learning about the concept of appropriate whiteness. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's, a coined, it's a term that I coined in the 1990s because whenever hate groups came to town or a hate incident around, arose, um, there'd be three groups of white people. There was the anti-racist action group that wanted to go out there and fight them just want to fight them and hold a demonstration and have 200 good white people against five Klansmen, you know, and fight them and fight them and fight them, which of course ended up in a narrative that the Klans were the victims because they were so outnumbered and usually as by, you know, it was a very patriarchal way of responding to, 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 to hate groups because it was always men wanting to go out and fight other white men. It was like funny, but not so funny when, you know, the narrative of them as victims got reinforced. Then the second group of white people, which often was the largest set, wanted to ignore it and say, this is just an aberration. We don't want our town you know, to get a bad name. We, we don't, they underreport hate crimes uh, and they can be in law enforcement as well in the media and stuff like that. We don't want our reputations damaged because they are not us. They do not represent us, it's their framing and so they want to ignore it but that works about as well as ignoring cancer so <laughs> that's not a good strategy and then there'd be people in the middle who wanted to know what to do they knew they didn't want to get into the anti-racist slug fest but they also didn't want to turn a blind eye to it and those were the people that i defined as striving to be appropriately white they wanted to take pride in their white identity they wanted to be able to say, I'm white and I'm proud without sounding like somebody in the hate movement. And so I'm spending a lot of time since the 1990s working on developing that white courage on an appropriate whiteness. That's what I think people need to work on. Linda Alcoff has written a wonder book. I think it's called The Future of Whiteness. That is a good place to start. A-L-C-O-F-F, -F, Linda Alcoff. I made me be misquoting her title, but I think it's called The Future of Whiteness. And it's kind of like, for me, one of the best discussions I've seen so far on appropriate whiteness. Wow. Another question, and we'll, we'll wrap up, I think, in a, in, a, in a few minutes, but there's so many questions coming in and really people wanting this question of tactics. And I think this concept of appropriate whiteness and courageous whiteness are very helpful and very powerful. 
you mentioned uh, in an interview about the racist incident in Starbucks of two black men hanging out and a white woman filmed the altercation that happened with police. And you said, well, that's a moment of courageous whiteness when she filmed it and posted it, right? So there's where calling out in a constructive and tactical way is a form of, uh, illustrates what you're saying about a form of courageous whiteness. Absolutely, absolutely. And I suspect that whenever, see what happens in our society that's so dedicated to white supremacy, that when you stand up against it, then you start getting reviled, attacked. I mean, look at what happened to the seven Republicans who voted for impeachment, because they voted their consciousness. And then they, they have to return back to communities that want to censure them, that want to do death threats against them and all of this other stuff. So it does take a lot of courage to speak up against white supremacy in the white community. I, I do not want to understate that because I fight white supremacy every day and I'm lauded as a hero by my community. When you're white and you fight white supremacy, you're lauded as a race traitor. And so that's why Mab wrote her book, Memoirs of a Race Traitor. <laughs> you know? And so it's a different calculation of risk. But I actually do believe that it's the salvation of the white souls that you're fighting for. It's not so that you know black people can do better. We're fighting for ourselves. But we need white people of courage to fight for the souls of white people. Because I don't think being white by definition is the problem. It's being white and coupling that with it with adherence to white supremacy ideology. And perhaps a good final question would be a synthesis of a number of questions we're getting about healing. People are asking, will people of color ever find a space of healing in this country? And others are asking, will there be a truly healed United States? Will that dream of the Statue of Liberty re be realized or will it remain a kind of ideal? Um, and so I was wondering if you're hopeful about the future? Are we I'm absolutely <laughs> hopeful about the future? I wouldn't be doing human rights work if I didn't think we were gonna win. I mean, I have a lot of opportunities to go lay on a beach with my Jamaican family and not be engaged <laughs> if I didn't think it was worth fighting. And so, yes, I'm very optimistic because of the other thing that is, again, about demographics is America's becoming younger, browner, more female and more queer. Mm -hmm. I mean, so these angry white men hanging on for dear life, they're demographically doomed. Even if we did nothing, they are demographically doomed because the only way for them to keep dominance is either number one, convince a lot of white women to have 19 kids and counting, and that ain't happening. <laughs> or number two, establish an apartheid-like system where a minority hangs on to power. I don't think that's happening either. And I'm really encouraged by the split in the white community. When I said um, whites are divided, whites have not been that divided in, in, in the history of America where there's an open repudiation of white supremacy. And the fact that young white people are leading that is, is very encouraging for me. Now, in terms of healing, I find doing this work to be all the healing that I need. I mean, but I also have to say in practical terms, I party as hard as I work and I play competitive pinochle and I like kicking ass over a card table. And I watch tennis because I'm going to be watching uh, Serena and Naomi Osaka tonight. Uh, and I love bloody content tax sports because I was raised with five brothers and I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan, unashamedly. So I try to have balance in my life. I, I have a toggle switch where I can turn the consciousness off and just enjoy being alive. And that's how I've been around for 50 years. Well, thank you so much for your wisdom for your vision. And I have one personal question to ask you. Mm -hmm. and it's a word you've been using frequently in interviews and it's a powerful word. And I'm not sure I understand the meaning entirely, but you're arguing for grace. And grace is a discipline. Grace as a kind of muscle that you cultivate in large part. And I was wondering if you can talk about that as we, as we conclude. The word grace became more visible in my work when I saw what happened to the parishioners, parishioners of Mother Emanuel Church, where the nine people in, Char in, in, in Char Charleston were killed, and Chris Singleton, one of the sons of, of, the, uh, of his mother who was killed in that massacre, 
he gave a very poignant interview where he said that offering forgiveness and grace is my way of reclaiming my dignity and not letting that murderer stain my life forever. And, and so he sees it as a form of regaining power and dignity and not letting the person who did the most harm to him rule his life forever. And so he saw forgiveness and grace as a, as, as a, um, as a reclamation of self. And it's the hardest thing he's had to do. He said, some people see it as a sign of weakness, but I don't, I see it as a sign of my power to offer that forgiveness and grace. And so I always said, after I heard his interview, well, if, if he can forgive somebody for murdering his mama, I can forgive a whole lot of other people. Very good. Thank you. And those are to conclude by, well, thank you, Professor Ross, so much for your time and for thank your- Thank y'all for having me. And I look forward to working with y'all in the future. I hope so. And for those of you who want to stick around, please look at our website at the UB Gender Institute. We have Barbara Smith coming on March 10th. Oh, at tell Barbara hi for me. Yes, I've seen your 110 page interview with her in 2003 in the Smith Archive. Uh, so stay tuned for an evening uh, with Barbara Smith at 7 p.m. on March 10th. You can sign up on our website. And this has been such a high point for me personally to talk to you, Professor Ross. Thank you again, and thank you all for joining us. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye.